Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm doing another color along of Worlds Within Worlds and this one I'm going to be doing the Cuckoo Clock which is right next to this wonderful lion page. So this lion page is one of the first pages I've ever done, also one of the first using Dorant ink tents and so I had done it using um, some Prismacolor with the background, some white Posca pen for the different whiskers over here um, but otherwise I'm going to continue with that over on this side and have some similar colors with that also using only Durant ink tents. So I want it to be complementary but not exact to that and so in order to kind of do that I've decided that I'm going to try to have some of the boughs here be this wonderful maroon color for the wood um, and then for the leaves bring in some greens so that'll be a bit different from this original Durant um, line that I had but I'll be bringing in that yellow for the clock and then maybe in bit for the background as well. And so they'll be a bit parallel but just a bit different to one another um, and so I will do some explanations and commentaries on the technique along the way but maybe not a full multi-hour long color along what I'll be doing is maybe just work on a specific element of it and then once I figure out um, how to show you enough of that specific element I'll stop recording and hopefully that'll be enough for you to follow along so I'm beginning with the wood and the four colors I'm using are red oxide, matter brown, dark chocolate, and Chinese ink. So for this one here, I'm doing it in the regular speed to show you, and I'm starting by defining my shadows with the Chinese ink. And so um, that kind of helps me decide the light source as well. And the nice thing with Kirby's books is that they are easy to figure out where the light source is coming from because his line work already shows you where the shadows are supposed to go. The next color here is this dark chocolate and I'm overlapping it and then pulling it into the uncolored area. And so that then allows it to gradiate the blend a bit more smoothly. And you can see I'm doing that same with the matter brown 1920. Um, overlapping it slightly and then making that highlight area a bit smaller and smaller. I would say that the matter brown is the main color of the wood, but the red oxide is that color highlighted, and then the dark chocolate is that color in shadow with the Chinese ink showing the main shadow. So speeding it up slightly, now I'm coming into an area where I'm actually starting with a light going into the shadow and that is because when I was looking at it it was easier for me to pinpoint where the highlights were as opposed to the shadows this time. So it doesn't really make that much of a difference on your workflow and some people prefer to stick with only light to dark, others prefer to stick with dark to light. I tend to go back and forth depending on what I'm seeing in the elements that I'm coloring in that moment. And you'll see over here I switch back to dark first going into light and that's because I really want to highlight the different shadows here. I'm noticing the shadows a bit more since it's covered by those leaves. Um, and to make the highlights I'm trying to at that point decide to color it along with the shape of the wood a bit more. So on those um, bulbs or the arches of the wood more light would be hitting and so that's what would get more light and more and more of that red oxide. And over here, even more dark and shadowy to kind of push it into the background a bit more, especially to show how those leaves are coming to the foreground with a tiny bit of light there. So for things that are straight up and down, like over here you have that parallel bow, I like to have the light kind of come into the middle of it, and so I'll have the dark shadows on either end and then come towards the light source in the middle. That's kind of different than what I had done at the top where the light source was more along that um, longer line as opposed to that shorter line, the length versus the width. And for this one, we'll notice that this bow has this really nice curve to it. So again, to kind of build up the shadows, it would be darker at the bottom and on that outside edge since my light source is coming from that upper right hand side. And you'll see that I'm having a lot more light at that bottom curve because I'm imagining that's a bit more of like a flatter curve. And so that bottom part of that curve would have a lot more of that light hit it. So that pretty much sums up the main techniques that I'm using, so let's speed up this video a tiny bit more. And as you can see with the rest of this wood, I'm again trying to honor the light source coming in from the upper right hand side, and I'm also trying to follow some of the shapes and the curves of the wood to make it get more dimensional and have a bit more life. I also started using a second sheet of paper for my resting hand and an art glove so that the oils from my fingers don't interfere with the paper and the cleanliness of the art. 
All right, so there's that first layer. Now it's time to activate it with water. I'm using the water pen from Derwent. Um, they're medium size. I don't know what sizes they are since they're not numbered. And as you can see with my technique, I'm starting from that highlighted area and then moving towards the darker area. It is really, really important that you do it in this way because that dark will be pulled into the highlight and destroy the highlight otherwise. Um, and so you can see here that water control is also really important. You don't want it to be dripping so much that you lose control, but having um, some extra water the way that I do here that we can see with the shine actually helps a lot with that blending because what you're doing is you're helping that water activate and then you're kind of pulling it into that darker area. Notice that when I let go to just wipe it off, I try to leave a drop behind. And that's because it's really easy to strip the paint pigments away with your brush. And so doing this small dabbing motion helps um, make sure that the paint stays on the paper and not on your brush as much. Once you go over one area, you can actually go over it a second time before it's completely dried, and this can help smooth that transition a bit. So um, timing with that is also really important. So you don't want to be completely dry or it won't move, but you can reactivate some of the pigments that haven't been fully activated and go over it just with a second quick brush stroke um, to, to smooth it out a tiny bit more. And so again, starting from that highlighted area, pulling that down towards the darker area and making sure that I um, have that, that water droplet that I'm pulling along to preserve that paint. And over here, you can see that I'm now going to start to cheat. Um, I remember I told you to start with that highlighted area and I'm doing that accurately here. But then when I'm coming into the darker area in just a second, you'll see that I'm actually starting with the darker area and moving from the dark to the light. And so this does, as I mentioned, destroy the highlight a tiny bit. So what I did was I jumped up to the highlight and then came down to that middle section to try to blend it out a tiny bit more um, to preserve that highlight. But it does darken the highlight if you do it that way. Sometimes you might want to do that. Sometimes the difference between the highlighted area and the shadow area is too stark and that's where you can kind of blend over it to make it a bit easier and I'll show you that later in the video because um, that's also a technique that you can kind of use. But otherwise it's pretty simple, just small controlled motions, make sure you're not coloring over the lines, periodically wipe off your brush to make sure that you're not carrying too much pigment from one section to another so that they don't all blend into each other too much. And um, over here, again, starting with that highlighted area because this is just a really, really dark section here since the wood is pushed to the back. And then just, I should have had a bit more water here. You can see it's a bit hard to blend it out um, and it's drying really, really quickly. Um, and so, but it's still enough water to be able to activate it. And I'm pulling the dark into the highlight a tiny bit because that difference between the dark and the light was a bit too much for me, especially since this was supposed to be in the background a bit more. And so that helps um, mute out that highlight a tiny bit. And so coming over here, ending it with that little section. Um, and then you'll see that I'm going to, in just a moment, um, after I finish activating the rest of it, um, yeah, come in over here and just blend out that highlight a tiny bit to make it a bit more muted since it is supposed to be in the background. All right, that sums up the main advice I have for activating the ink tints on these wood elements. Remember to start from the highlight, move towards the dark areas, use enough water and leave a droplet behind to not desaturate it when you wipe your paintbrush off. And you remember, you can go over it one more time when it's still damp in order to smooth out those blends. Here's the time lapse for the rest of the wood elements. In just a moment, I'll show you how to do the leaves up next. I'm now going to begin coloring the leaves. I'm using a range of colors here. And so they are going from dark to light, the Chinese ink, amber, oak, leaf green, fern, olive line, and gold. And so I'm beginning again with the lightest color here with that gold color. And I'm just going to decide where my light is on these leaves. I don't really have anything consistent that I'm doing to all of the leaves and that's in part because the leaves are organic and therefore have lots of variety. But the one thing that I am doing that is consistent is when I'm going with the colors, I'm going with them in that order of um, either light to dark or dark to light, but always within that same color order. And so here 
because this bottom portion has more heavy line work i think it's more in shadow and that's why i decided to skip down to that area and just begin to just define my shadow here so i'm coming in with the leaf green in that darker areas and then it's built into that olivine that will then get built into that sun and when i have that yellow on the leaf i am actually covering it with the green and that's because i don't want these leaves to look like they are dying or part of fall i want that yellow to be part of the highlight but not necessarily um, a different like to suggest a season and that's why the yellow gets overlaid with that green um, and so, yep, you can kind of just see my process here very slowly, just deciding where my colors go. And you notice that with um, Derwent Ink Tents, you don't necessarily have to go over um, it multiple times after you activate it, if you do that before you activate it. So what you can do is before you activate it, just go over it as though you would a color pencil without burnishing and just start layering it, make sure your pencil is nice and sharp and just really define where your light is and where your shadows are and what kind of shape you're trying to build um, and carve out with the colors that you're using. And so over here you can see that I've decided that um, to kind of emphasize that that bottom part of the leaf is in shadow, I'm actually going to come in with a second light source um, along that, um, I guess, the big central vein of the leaf and also in this lower right hand corner. And here again, I'm just covering it with that gold, but I'm not going to leave it gold. That's just to help with the highlight. I'm going to again cover it with that olivine. And you'll see, I'm just going to keep going over this layer by layer by layer until I'm happy with it. I actually don't do these many layers on the other leaves. I got a bit lazy and I kind of wish I did because out of all the different leaves in the final product, this one ended up being the prettiest just because of how much time I had spent earlier on it. Um, just trying to make it look more three-dimensional and dynamic. All right, and so now I'm beginning the water and I'm ready for that. And I'm starting again at that highlighted area and then just kind of pushing it up towards um, the edges of this element, the same that I had done with the wood boughs. And so it's the same technique, again, just starting from that light, very, very slowly scramble your way up towards the top, make sure you have enough water, and then make sure you leave that water drop at the end so that you're not desaturating the deeper colors by accidentally dragging it away, unless of course that's something you want to do. And so here again, I could have started from the middle, but instead I started from that highlight and just really just kind of build it up towards where I want that color to go. And you can see that it's created this nice um, three-dimensional dynamic leaf that has highlights on it, low lights on it, and some good transitional colors in between. And there you go. I hope that this explanation of the leaf is enough to get you started with some of my tips and techniques for how I'm making it work. Um, enjoy the rest of this leaf section in time lapse and um, I'll pretty much be in time lapse for the rest of this video as well. If you could please do me a favor and leave a comment below and let me know if you like this style of video editing or this length of video, that could be very helpful for me since I am a new YouTuber and that can help let me know whether I'm on the right track or not with um, creating the kinds of videos that you enjoy watching when it comes to coloring. Enjoy a quick cuteness break and I will see you at the end of the video. Have a good day.
And there you go, here is my completed page using Derwent Inktense. Um, similar, like I said, in palette to the lion page to this side. Um, but overall, I'm very pleased with the end result. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.